Angels. For thousands of years and across nearly all religions and cultures, these spiritual creatures have been spoken of, written about, and believed in. Angels that help people. Angels that bring messages. Even fallen angels. And what about guardian angels? Is there an angel that's assigned to us in heaven before we're born? That never leaves our side, even for a moment while we're here on earth. And then that gently helps escort our souls back to heaven when our time on earth is completed. Do angels really exist? Well, one woman from Ireland named Lorna Byrne says the answer to that question is absolutely, positively, and without a doubt, yes. I, I always say to everybody, I have seen them from the moment I opened my eyes. You know, I remember lying in my cot and maybe I was only about that size, you know, and seeing them and seeing my mom, you know, and to me, you have to remember as a very young child, you know, you see the angels and you see your parents and your aunts and all of that. They're all just part of the family. You know, I didn't know any difference. I didn't even know they were angels. It was just the time when I was playing with my little brother in front of the fire. It was like as if his hand went into mine and mine went into his, and it all sparkled and I laughed. And he was about the same age as me, just a little older. And it was then the angel said that they were angels and I must keep it a secret and told me that my little brother was a soul. He had died before I was born. And on occasions I would have seen him in my mom's arms as a baby, you know, when she'd be asleep in the armchair. And sometimes, you know, I would see him much older. He would play with me and he would be much older. The fact that Lorna is writing best-selling books would be considered a miracle in itself by most people. Lorna has been challenged with severe dyslexia from birth. She cannot read, she barely can write, even having trouble penning her own name. You know, they kept saying to me, you must keep it a secret, don't say anything, as I grew as a child. And the doctors had told my parents I was retarded, um, because way back in Ireland then, they didn't know about that. And any child that was slow, you know, you got branded, you know, straight away. So you were put in the back of the class. And I wouldn't be here talking to you either because if I had said something to my parents, there's an angel standing beside you. Um, Ireland was full of institutions then. I, I could have ended up in one of those so I wouldn't be here. And I'm so glad, you know, that, and I'm looking at the angels now and looking at yourselves at the same time, that, you know, I didn't say anything, you know, that I did keep it a secret, but I did learn as, as I grew, you know, even as a child of 10, I often remember aunts and neighbors saying, you know, passing comments, oh, she's slow, she wouldn't understand. And the angels used to just say to me, Lorna, they know no better. And of course, I've had the best teachers in the world. I've had the angels, they have literally taught me everything I know. Throughout Lorna's writing, she often speaks of a multitude of angels that constantly descend from heaven, simply waiting for any of us to ask for their help. She calls these the unemployed angels. And while these angels are available to anyone when needed, Lorna says our guardian angel is special to us. Your guardian angel, I, I, I think it's actually just so beautiful. Um, before you were conceived, before you were born, you were a soul already in heaven, that speck of light of God. And you already met your guardian angel in heaven. And I have to say, you and your guardian angel knew each other so well. And in heaven, before you came at all into, into the human little baby at, at conception, you had already chosen your parents and you loved them unconditionally no matter how imperfect they were you know and that's a very important thing thing to remember and when when you die your guardian angel when your time comes takes hold of your soul ever so loving and gently because I've seen it so many times and 
brings your soul from your body back home to heaven. So you're not alone. And at that very moment, you can see your guardian angel. You, you know, and you will see lots of other angels. It's just your body dies. That's the part of us that die because we have that soul that's that speck of light of God. You live forever. Lorna's messages are so highly revered that her next two books, A Message of Hope from the Angels and Love from Heaven, debuted at number one on the UK Sunday Times book chart. Her books have been translated into 30 languages and published in over 50 countries. Guardian angels, yes. now they are here. Yes, I can yeah. see everyone's guardian angel. Yeah. I can see, you know, physically as I see, I see you. When Lorna is at an event or appearing on a radio or television program, she often states that her angels tell her what to say or what not to say. I wondered exactly how her angels communicate with her. It's actually in loads of different ways, and I have to say, um, the angels are being the angels can be, you know, so funny at times, you know, so cheerful, you know, they mimic us at times, and I, I know why do they do that. That's to help to cheer. Sometimes it's myself up, but it can be help to help to cheer you up. And I have to smile when you ask that question, you know. Um, they were laughing in, in, that, in that sense. So they, they communicate with me in actually loads of different ways. Sometimes I would say to you, it's, it's like a three-way system or a five-way system because I would be able to hear them quite clearly as I would hear you and yet hear you speaking at the same time. And don't ask me how I can separate it. I just do. And sometimes, you know, if an angel is with me, like the angel Michael or Hoses or Elijah, the ones that are in my life quite a lot, and I could be walking down the road and they would communicate in, in a different way at, at times, especially if, if I'm on my own and, and they have made themselves as visible as you are. They're walking with me and if anyone passes by, they would see them too. Um, but wouldn't recognize that it was an angel. So they would talk one-on-one. -on -one. But I do prefer when an angel comes, or sometimes when, when they come and sit around the table and talk one at a time in that way. I, I listened recently to a radio call-in show, and so many people would, would ask, want to ask you specific questions. And sometimes you would say, um, I'm not being told that, or you would be say, I am being told that. So yeah. who tells you that? Is it, is it, it would be the angel standing beside me. I would actually sometimes have to say, I can't say that to the person, you know. And you you think and, this to, to... Oh yes, even be, and I know you wouldn't notice it on, on, right. on the radio show as such, but yes, I would be communicating silently. Yes, that's another way with the angel. Or you could, some people say, is that telepathically? And I suppose maybe it is. I would often say, no, I can't say that to the person. This is a human being. Sometimes I do have to remind the angels that we are human beings, as well as having that spiritual side, you know, having a soul, you know, that's, that's that speck of light of God. And I think it is always important. Sometimes I often say to God, please, please remember, I'm only flesh and blood, <laughs> you know, in that, in that way, because I'm not perfect because, and none of us are perfect. One of the worst things any parent could imagine would be the loss of a child, especially at a young age. But Lorna says she has seen the souls of many young children who are allowed to return and be around their parents for as long as they are needed. W would you talk a little bit about a, what, what an angel is and what an angel isn't, in the sense that I know at, at a lot of places that you speak, people will say, my, my little baby son passed, is he now my angel? No, that's not your angel. And I, I suppose a lot of people are, you know, I used to feel kind of embarrassed when at first, now not for the people, you know, it was actually for the angels, <laughs> you know. I used to feel a little, oh God, will, will I hurt them, you know. And I was told, no, Lorna, you, you must tell them. 
angels are creatures created by God. Um, you and I and everybody out there in the world and those that have died um, all have a soul, that speck of light of God. So you live forever. You never, never die. It's only your, your body. You are more, all as I can say, by billions of times more than any angel. Because just imagine, you are that speck of light of God. You are pure and you're full of love. And, you know, I used to just feel kind of embarrassed for the angels and you say, oh, oh, you know, will I say it? And they just insisted, yes, to tell people this. They do love, I have to say, when we as parents or brothers and sisters or aunts or uncles or even grandparents say, you know, my little niece is an angel in heaven. It is actually an expression of love because in life, we know deep down inside of us that angels are, are a living being of some kind in that, in that way. And in a way, it's helping us to think of our loved one is an angel in heaven, but they're more than any angel. That is the incredible thing. They are more than any angel. Why do you think your guardian angel never leaves you for one second? Because it is in the presence of God, that speck of light that is your soul, and why other angels love to come in and around us and want to help us all of the time. I, I always say to er everybody that your guardian angel is like three steps behind you. Now, I don't mean three human steps. It's actually just this gap between you and your guardian angel. It's quite small, but yet at times it can look bigger, and yet your guardian angel can be all around you. You know, and that's really hard to explain. And other angels, I'm afraid, walk in front of you. They, they do everything. They stand at the side of you. Sometimes they can even be above you. They're everywhere. When I was walking down the street recently in New York, you know, and the street was crowded, and I was just, never mind the guardian angels with everybody, but just watching the angels moving in and out between people, you know, and stopping and maybe whispering to them something that the guardian angel has asked asked for them um, and sometimes seeing what I call the unemployed angels and um, helping someone carry a bag or helping a mother with a child or, or just seeing the guardian angels trying to to keep us calm telling us that everything will be all right because maybe we're worried or stressed about something. Yeah, I think I was maybe four or five years of age and um, the angel said that from now on I would just see the light of the guardian angel because the guardian angel is completely different from every other angel. It is the gatekeeper of your soul and it's the one angel that can never leave you. Other angels come and go. But on many occasions, you know, to me out of the blue, um, a stranger's guardian angel could open up. I can never say I want your you know, ask a guardian angel, you know, please open that light up so I can see you in your full glory. But that light is your guardian angel. Luana recently prayed with Muslims at Park 51 Mosque in New York City near Ground Zero. It was the second time Luana has appeared there and prayed. She says that she is constantly being told by God and her angels that Americans need to worship together to put aside our religious differences and concentrate on what we have similar. Yes, that is one of the messages I've been given to give to the world and especially to America because America is meant to be the place where this really coming together of all faiths and praying together under the one umbrella. You know, prayer is extremely powerful and it can change the world for the good, for the better. You know, and, and we forget that in that way. So yes, that's why I was at the mosque and, you know, and praying with them there as well. And just seeing all of the angels, like, you know, it, it doesn't matter what religion you are. And just seeing all the angels of prayer, every time somebody would start a prayer, it's like as if before it's uttered out of you, you know, the angels of prayer are there. And then as soon as you stop, they're gone, you know, in that second. And you could see this happening, you know, because the place was crowded. It was like switching on lights in one sense, you know, just to help you 
in that way and the place was crowded with angels. And her people gather to pray at different times and on occasions and it's, you know, or if it's in a church, that place becomes peaceful. And for us all to gather together, to pray together, will help us not to be so afraid of each other, will help to bring peace. Because I know as a Catholic, you know, if a Muslim or, or a Jewish person came into a Catholic church and started to pray in their way, um, I know people would be looking at them and would be afraid and saying, what's going on? That's evil, that's bad. And it's not, because they're praying to God. It would, it's, it's for us to get together under that one umbrella and pray together and get to know each other. And from their peace, you know, we realize we don't have to be doing what we're doing. It's just so important and it's meant to happen in America. That you say there are angels at every church. There's there no, no specific church. Is that right? That is right. Every single church. It doesn't matter whether it's a Catholic church, a president, um, a mosque, or I know there are so many of of all different religions. Um, there's angels there all of the time, and there's always angels praying where people gather to pray. There is always angels there praying. It becomes, in a sense, like um, a holy place, if you like. It's, it's a place then where the angels will go and stay, and certain angels will stay because God will put them there. And that's all religions. You know, I don't know why we're fighting over God or using God as an excuse to have control over human beings. Um, and we have to try and remember, life is not just about material things. You know, life is about much more. It is about your soul and it is about God in that, in that way. And we're so focused on the material things, you know, that, that makes us listen to the other side. As a young girl, one of the special gifts that Luna says she was given by God and the angels was a vision of the man that she would marry and a preview of the life that they would have together. That's, that's right, I was only about 10 years of age and I went, um, I was off fishing with my dad, which my dad took me a lot fishing with him. And I just said to him, can I go on up the river? Because the angels had said I had a, a special angel for me to meet. And my dad said, off you go, so off I went. and. You know, at one stage along the bank, I was told to stop, and I stopped, and here I was looking around. Well, I don't see any special angel. And then the next minute, this beautiful angel just walked across the water. He was, he is magnificent. He hasn't changed. All I can say is he's dressed in all of the amber colors you could ever think of. And the way his clothing is, it's like as if it's wrapped around him. You know, I, I can't describe that but very, very beautiful, but all angels are beautiful. And the first thing a 10-year-old child would say, can I not do that? Can I not walk across the water? And he just took my hand and said, no, you know, and we sat down and he was so big and I was so small and we sat on a tuft of grass. I don't know how we managed to do that now that I even think of it. And he said he had something important to tell me and he told me his name was Angel Elijah. And it was like as if a big screen came across the water. It's hard to describe it. You couldn't describe it as glass or water or, or a curtain, but you just could see this big screen. And um, he just said, you know, I'm going to show you the man you're going to marry. And I see this young man, and I was only 10. Like, you know, I'm going to fall in love. You know, he says, you're going to fall in love with them. I wasn't even thinking of those things, you know? And I could see him walking, and, and there was trees each side of him. And he was on, you know, to me it looked like at that time, you know, you could see leaves on the ground. And, you know, I giggled at the idea. Sure. You know, I'd fall in love with them because I was only 10. And he said we would marry and have children and we'd have ups and downs, and then, at the end, he told me the part I got cross with in one sense as a child, a little annoyed with him. He said he was going to 
we weren't going to grow old together. He was going to get sick. It was like my hand and his, and his hand was huge. And I looking at him and kind of looking like this, and I, I say to him, why did you have to tell me that? You know, and I, I turned away from him and then looked back at the screen. And um, he just put his hand on my head and he said, I will put it to the back of your mind. But I never forgot. You put it to the back of my mind. But I never forgot. It was always, always there. And the day when I was 19 or whatever age I was, um, and I saw Joe walking up the street, coming into the place where I was working the garage, Oh, I knew it was him. I recognised him so clearly, you know. And I always remember saying to the secretary there, because I was looking out the window, he's coming in for a job and I don't want him to get it. <laughs> I was rejecting him, but yet so excited. And I knew what was going to happen, you know. And of course he came in and he got the job and everything like that. and. He asked me out and we did marry and have children and I suppose from nearly the moment we married his health started to go down. Well everything he had, he had said, you know, we had ups and downs in, in the sense of we were so poor. Um, we grew vegetables, you know, grew a lot of the food ourselves. But yet I had the angels there. Many times I would have cried and give, given out. And just watching his health going down and what was happening to him um, and trying to help him to keep his dignity. Because at times he would, he always looked well. People would never have understood. And he was a man and he wanted to keep his dignity and he didn't want people to know you know, so it was a battle that way, you know, but even with the children, you know, as they started to understand Dad doesn't be well physically, you know, if Dad went out into the garden at any stage or was out doing a job, they would actually be running in and out, keeping an eye on him and helping him because they knew something could happen, you know, and of course they had that experience of many things happening many times. You know, but the important thing was, you know, I could never say to him, I know you're only going to be here for so long because when he was well, you want someone to live their life and that is the most important thing. You don't go up and tell someone, by the way, what's happening to you is going to kill you, you're going to die, you know, because then a person can stop living life. And I never wanted that and I would never do that to any human being at all and that's an important thing to remember and he did live his life he did have great times and I know he had times that were really really hard and I know even for the children at times were really really hard. Faced with such acute poverty and the illness of her husband Joe I asked Lorna if she was ever upset with the angels for not helping her more. No, well, well they did help me in, in loads of ways and um, why would God treat me any different than anyone else? You know, um, I wouldn't expect him to be. I'm a human being as well. You know, I'm flesh and blood and I'm very conscious that I have a soul and my guardian angel because I see all of the time. Um, I wouldn't ask God to treat me different. I wouldn't say to God, I wouldn't be who I am today. I wouldn't, if I had did that maybe, you know, the Archangel Michael mightn't have come into my life then, you know, all of the other angels, all those messages. So I had to live, you have to live your human life too. You know, that, that's, that's important. So there is a heaven. You, you're telling us that you know for a fact there is a heaven. Yes, definitely there is a heaven. How do you know there is a heaven? Um, I didn't know you were going to ask that question. <laughs> well because I died and God sent me back and I didn't want to come back because when you go to heaven, I can assure you, you don't want to come back. Like I have met many people who would say to me, you know, oh, they would want to come back straight away, 
you know, and I look at them and I would say, but why would you into a human body that, you know, gets pain, gets sick, you know, going through all of these things in, in life? And then suddenly they say, oh, God, no, I wouldn't want to come back. <laughs> you know, heaven is, it's God's love. You just, you just feel it. It just, it's beyond human words. I can't even describe it. And, and your soul is drawn to it. You know, your soul goes and it goes with your guardian angel. And God's love is so, it's just so overwhelming. That's, I, I don't know how to explain it. Next, I wanted to know what happens when we get to heaven. Do we stay in heaven? Do we get a job? The only way I can put it to you, um, we think in human ways. You know, we, we think, well, I should have a task. I should be working. I should be the cameraman in heaven. But heaven is not earth. Heaven is not human life. It's beyond that. You just want to be in the presence of God. But yet God at times will send your soul back to be around someone else someone you love to help them in their life. And you have to remember those that have died and have gone to heaven, they can do much more for us because they can intercede with God for us. They can ask because they're already there. And, you know, lots of people would say to me, you know, well, I didn't get to say goodbye or I had this row or I didn't talk to them for years and now they're really hurting. When someone dies and their soul goes to heaven, they love you so much. All of that is gone. It's like all of that was trivial. It meant nothing. They just love you. And they just, they just want you to know that, that they love you. There's no need for forgiveness. It has been wiped away. You said that if you happen to see a spirit, you, well, can you tell if a spirit has been to heaven or not? Um, Yes. How could I say that? How could, that's a question I haven't been, been asked. Um, sometimes I might actually visit a graveyard. You know, it could, I could have some reason to be there. And I always remember when my grandparents had died. And my grandparent was being buried in this graveyard that kind of overlooked Dublin. And the angels had said to me, go for a walk around and I didn't know why they were sending me for for a walk and I was walking up and down and I just said a little prayer for all the families because as far as I what I know is that it's only the body the remains that are there the souls are already gone but I had to smile when I turned the corner I come to this grave and there was a guardian angel and this beautiful soul a young man sitting there and the guardian angel wrapped around this soul and I was being told that the young man was a little hesitant. He had already been in heaven but he was a little hesitant and God just allowed this to happen. It was for me for some reason to, to tell him that it was all right, you know, that his parents love him and, you know, even though he was missing them for a moment in that, in that way. I think it was in the way the accident happened. He was killed instantly. And it was like when I spoke to him and said it was fine. You know, what are you doing here? You know, do you see your guardian angel? And it was like, you know, for the first time in one sense, even though he had been in heaven, but God sent him back. God often does that. You know, because we're his children. He loves us. He wants us to be completely at peace. You know, and it was like straight away, he suddenly, oh, and then they were gone. In one of the most moving entries in Lorna Burns' book, Angels in My Hair, she says the angels had her look upon the scene of a terrible accident. Three boys on bicycles were struck by a truck. Yeah, that happened um, when I was working in the petrol station. I know I'll have to skip loads of it, but just everything went still and quiet. You know, um, even the forecourt, everything did. And the angels had said I had to watch and look down the road. And I don't know how, even today when I've gone back there, how I could see so far down. That is incredible. But I was to pray at the same time and to watch and I saw these three young boys on bicycles. 
you know, and they were having the time of their life. They were enjoying, they were just being boys. And then I see this Arctic truck coming along and it came on the outside of them. And they all went to heaven, but it was just seeing what happened. So the, the truck struck the boys? This truck struck, went right over them. You know, I don't know whether, you know, I even saw them, you know, reaching out to each other. They were just having a great day in that way. But it was like at, at the same moment, everything was in slow motion. You know, the Arctic moving along, the boys dying at that moment, and just seeing this beautiful light and seeing the road being paved with angels. It's the only way I can, can do it. And even though the boys' bodies were left on the ground, it was just so lovely to see them cycling still to heaven with all the angels around them and their guardian angel. And they hadn't got a care in the world. It was just so beautiful. And then everything came back to normal. It was like, you know, all of a sudden, you know, in the shop and the forecourt, somebody ran in and said, oh, did you see what happened? What way did the Arctic go? He didn't know what had happened. And when you say Arctic, you mean a truck, right? A truck, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a, a big, huge right. truck. Mm -hmm. And um, he didn't know what had happened, you know. But it was very beautiful to see those young boys going to heaven. People may have a, a difficult time believing, but you say mm. that you actually have been in the presence of God, that you have met God. Yeah. Could, you, could you explain? Here I'm saying to God now, what way do I start? You know, um, well, one time, what, how can I explain this? At times, the angels take my soul. And I was in heaven as well when, when my bo human body had actually died. And I have met God and I have to just say, you know, one of the things he often says to me on occasions is, Lorna, why are you hiding from me? And I have to say, he always looks like a young man. He gives such a human appearance, but he is such light and the love is just, again, it's so overwhelming. You, you, can't, you can't describe it. And I always feel like running and hiding you know, in that, in that way. And I don't know why, I can't really answer that question. I don't know why, why God does that for me. God is real. And I know people right across the world of all religions, you know, like it could be a priest or a minister or a rabbi or, you know, a head of a church and says to me, Lorna, is God really real? And I'd be shocked when they say that. And I say, yes, he is real. And that's what we need to remember. We need to remember that God is real and we have a soul and we have a guardian angel and heaven is real. We will all go home one day, you know. And at that moment of death, as I said, when your guardian angel takes hold of your soul, you want to get there as quick as possible. Lorna's popularity in Europe is unquestioned. But she says the angels keep telling her that she must return to America, that she has specific messages for Americans, and that we need to wake up a bit. I asked her exactly what she meant. Well, I, I smile at that, like, because, you know, even when I was a child, um, I used to see these angels. They're called the American Gathering Angels, and they've been gathering people from all over the world, from all nationalities, all walks of life, and all religions, and even, even those that believe in nothing. And isn't that so incredible? Just think about it. Have been gathered, like God knows where you've come from originally, sure. but you've been gathered and brought here, you know, to, to America. You know, you are the new race. Um, America is, is, is the gateway to man's future. And, you know, God keeps sending me back to America because America has such a huge role to play. It has so many of the answers. And, and the biggest answer one it has is, is in changing, you know, in, that, in, in the sense of the spiritual side coming out more 
and intertwining and we finding the answers. And I know a lot of Americans, you know, look in at America only, you don't look out so much. So God keeps sending me back, you know, and I keep saying to him, you know, they're not really listening. What else can I do, you know? But he keeps sending me back saying, you've got to help them to awaken and to realize that you have been gathered from all over the world, that you are the new race, that you are all Americans, no matter whether you're different color skin or different religion, you need to come together as one. Luana says that she has been given a gift by God of seeing some of mankind's possible futures. She says that some of these scenarios are very, very good. We have to come together to under that umbrella to unify and to bring peace. And, you know, one of the futures I was shown was just so beautiful, you know. I was standing on, on a, a mountaintop, kind of looking down into the valley, and I know Angel Michael was there, and I know God was there as well, and I looking down and seeing, I don't know how many thousand people or 100,000 people there were, you know, it was, it was enormous. And they were all down there, all the different religions, because you could tell. I could see the different clothing, you know, what one religion, you know, holds or wears, and looking down and seeing them mingling with each other and being together, and they all praying together in their own way. Like, it was, it was incredible. And just seeing those angels of prayer, you know, it was, I can't put it into words. These people weren't ever again fighting or killing each other or fighting over God over, or over material things. Everything was peaceful, everything was good. You know, um, and I know I tried to describe some of that in the book, but not all of it. But we have to get to that stage, we really do. That's a real possibility if everyone... It is more than possible, it is possible. Ultimately, each of us needs to make up our own minds about God, angels, and everything miraculous. But at the very least, Lorna Burns' messages help us to recognize and remember the most important things in our life. If Lorna's messages from the angels are true, then God has given each of us a gift of unimaginable wonder. I hope each of you recognizes the angels in your life.